I'd like to welcome everyone this afternoon. Uh, we will now commence our uh, meeting, and I call the meeting to order. Let's have our roll call, please. All right, you got any Mr. McLaw? Is he present? He's trying. <laughs> what is it? Yeah, I didn't pack him all. I thought he was, but I don't believe he is. <laughs> it's not working. It's not working. It's, it's not working. Raise your rear hand. <laughs> they see. They see. Uh, uh, so you don't want to follow my orders anyway, do you, Mel? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, may I begin now, then, Mel? All right, uh, Mr. James. Uh, Mr. Mans, have you got something to uh, yes. say about Mr. James's absence? Mr. James is not here tonight um, due to illness and. Um, Keep in our thoughts and um, expect him back. So, if the, board, if the board would excuse him tonight. Uh, do we need a motion? Uh, yes. I move for his um, excuse Sorry. from being here. Sorry. Can please vote by hand. Okay. All, right. All in favor indicate raising your right hand. Raise your hand. All opposed, like sign. Okay. Uh, on the agenda, I believe there's been an addition. A request for an addition to the agenda. Mr. Manager, you want to speak to that? Yes, we um, received a request Friday after the agenda had been released and printed from the Falk Falkland Volunteer Fire Department. They're refinancing a vehicle and need the county's consent in doing that as part of the, the banking. So if the board would consider adding that as an items for decision after item number three, which would be your appointment to the Greenville Planning and Zoning Commission. All right, do we have a motion to approve the agenda with the amendment? All right. Let's vote. Ready to vote, Madam Clerk. Okay, thank you, James. I believe you're next. Mr. Chairman, did you want to do the invocation? Oh, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's stand and uh, we will have our invocation and our pledge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time of assembly in our community. Father, we ask for your wisdom as leaders, Lord, that we make the correct decisions and lead in your way. Father, we lift up Commissioner James, Father, as his body is ill. We ask for healing, Lord, for his body. Lord, we ask that our citizens be engaged, Lord, and again, that you just give us wisdom to lead. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Join me in the pledge to our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Mr. Rhodes. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. We have a couple of public hearings back to back uh, from the planning department tonight. The first one is a closeout request for a community development block grant we received back in 2009. <clears throat> this particular one was to provide technical assistance to our office. We've uh, completed the work that was part of that grant and it actually included uh, some sessions with East Carolina and also they provided a report on housing back to us. Uh, the major outcome of this, other than some continuing ed hours for one of our staff members, as well as some um, a continued collaboration with the university, we did submit, as you'll recall, a housing development grant that we hope to use if we're funded to uh, further our partnerships with Grifton Mission Ministries and College Park Baptist Church out of Winston-Salem, such as we've done with the uh, town of Winterville over the last couple of months. Uh, with that, uh, we've completed all the activities, of, as I mentioned, and today we are required to hold a public hearing to close out and gather any public input for those closeout materials. Ultimately, we're recommending that um, the chairman is authorized to sign the closeout um, materials and authorize staff to move forward with submitting that back to the state. Mr. Chairman. If there's nothing else, I declare the public hearing open. Are there anyone signed up to speak for or against that? Mr. Chairman, um, there's actually two people signed up, but tonight we actually have five different separate public hearings, and I believe um, the first person had signed up for redistricting, which is actually our um, fourth public hearing. 
they could speak now if they wanted, I suppose. And then the second person that signed up on, the, on this public hearing was about property tax, and I believe that's probably just your regular public addresses to the board. Um, if, so there's not one for this? Unless they're indicating it, they want to Is come anyone to present that desires to speak to the issue that Mr. Rose just described? If not, I declare the public hearing closed. Much pleasure to the board. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All right. Okay, Mr. Rose. The second item under consideration tonight is a rezoning request. This is one that the board may remember. It has been before you a couple of times within the last few years. The request is from Baldwin Associates uh, concerning a 3.6 acre tract on Old River Road. Uh, it's currently owned by River Road Mini Storage. And this is to revise the general commercial condi conditional district uh, zoning to allow a U-Haul rental business to be run out of that same operation. And remember, with general, condition, general commercial conditional district rezoning, that only allows specific uh, types of uses with on, within the property. Um, this particular process has to follow the same process as a normal rezoning. And um, with that, just a little history on this property. Back in December of 2009, there was a request to actually rezone the property to General Commercial Conditional District, and that was to allow an expansion of the mini storage facility that started there even before zoning was in place. Um, back on, in January of 2011, a second rezoning was a, uh, also permitted a <coughs> flea market to be established within that same area. The area that we're talking about tonight is shown in red. This is that denotes general commercial zoning. You can see from the aerial photograph underneath the red there were a couple of uh, existing. James, are you referring to it's, your monitor? It's not up there. Yes. Thank you. There it is. Okay. A um, couple of um, storage facilities that were already there, and additional ones have been added since that time. This is located just south on Old River Road, close to its <coughs> intersection with Bears Construction Road and adjacent to Cypress Sands Mobile Home Park. Um, the area is located, as far as the uh, land use plan is concerned, in agricultural open natural resource conservation areas. It allows a variety of uses there. Uh, most of those areas are denoted by being within the 100-year floodplain. This particular area is not, though. Uh, the general commercial district actually allows a number of different uses. If we had allowed general commercial outright, there were about 100 different uses that could go in here. Again, specifically, we're asking or um, recommending that only one particular use be added at this point. Um, this is, again, a site uh, just adjacent to the mobile, mobile home um, park. And this is the general layout of that site, bounded in red, as you can see it on the screen. Um, these units that are shown in blue already exist. There are three others that are included on a plan that's already been approved by the board. We also, of course, have screening and buffering requirements that have been put in place, as well as parking. Um, as I mentioned, there are several existing storage uh, facilities out there on site. Um, the planning board has reviewed this and feel like this is in conformance with the land use plan and voted to approve or recommend the approval of this particular request at their July 20th meeting. Uh, staff also recommends re uh, approval, and uh, also we've determined that we feel it is consistent with the land use plan. With that, Mr. Chairman, we'll turn it over to you for the public right. hearing. I declare the public hearing open. Mr. Manager, do we have anyone signed up for that? Uh, no, sir. Uh, all right, we have one present that's not signed up, so please come up and give your name and speak, please. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. I'm Mike Baldwin, commission member, excuse me. <laughs> um, and I would like to tweak it a little bit. Um, the word U-Haul gets used um, generically a lot, kind of like Frigidaire. Every refrigerator used to be a Frigidaire back some years ago. But um, James, is there a, a better word? You know, there's Ryder, there's U-Haul. Um, could we... Could we find a better word, a kind of a fit-all word that... Um, 
we've had this discussion at the planning board level and the staff's interpretation even though it was specific for u-haul that it is for a particular type of moving vehicle and we would apply that to whether it's a rider or a u-haul type facility so that's not a problem so your language gives him what is requested is yes, that sir. correct all right okay. go ahead and and that's all i have all right. and you'll, you. if you'll see uh i, I came by a uh, mini storage on the way out here and and they had a u-haul uh uh facility right there that is this part of their uh mini storage as well so it is it is very common uh for this to be allowed uh where you do have many storage. So other than that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, I got a uh, the, three yeah. the three units that was not has not been built yet, are they gonna be built or is the trailers going in that area? Uh, Mr. Smith, I, I do feel uh, as you know, the other units fill up that those units still intend on being built. Is there gonna be enough room to put the trailers between these storage units so how are you going to do that well they'll obviously you 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 can't put a, a trailer where you don't have space so uh they'll have to use you know space management uh in, in that concern okay. anything else Ethan? no all right so thank you sir uh thank anyone else desire to speak to this issue if not, I declare the public hearing closed. What's the pleasure to board? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All right, any discussion? Not, let's vote. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Manager. Yes, next item for public hearing is a schedule of values. If Kathy Booker, our tax administrator, will come forward, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, good evening. We have um, the public to speak on the schedule of values. The time is designated for tonight's meeting. All right. So this another public hearing? Yes, sir. I declare this public hearing open. Has anyone signed for this, uh, Mr. Manager? Uh, no, sir. Not at this time. Uh, all right. Ms. Harris, come up, please. As you normally do, tell us so everybody else will know. <laughs> I'm Brenda Harris. I represent the the citizens of Pitt County. This is a public hearing, so I'm hoping that you'll allow the presentation. It's a little bit late. Do you think you might could help me get the presentation on here, James? Can you? Um, I have a, no, no, a public hearing is not I'm sorry, I was just asking her the question. Uh, I, I just wanted That's you fine. to know. Thank you. Um, she answered it. But it's within the, the chairman's discretion. To limit it. Okay. Well, let's go on with it. Maybe I'll determine that when we get there. Okay. It's, um, go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Schedule Pepper. of values. I put together Mike. Thank mm -hmm. you, Ms. Harris. He's fixing you. Okay. I put together a presentation because my opinion is that we don't need a, a schedule of values. In North Carolina, you can have a schedule of value increase every four to eight years. In my opinion, from the, the things that I have, have actually seen, we need a correct evaluation. It goes down to the schedule of values. Can you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, I believe we need a correct evaluation. Each one of you have voted not to raise taxes. What our tax administrator has not told you is that a schedule of values is what's considered. Um, okay, you're gonna you're gonna help me. It's considered a concept. That, do you understand what that means? That when they give you that concept, I not only paid for and pulled 04 and 08 and 012 because I have an investment in Pitt County. I've been treated unfairly. And so it put me on the radar to try to see what the issues were. And in the schedule of values, um, what we're looking at is that you voted to not raise taxes. I can tell you that I have reviewed it line by line. There are a few places it goes down. There are many places it goes up. But if you made that commitment and you meant it, then you need to ask your tax department you tell me what's going up, folks, and you tell me what's going down so that we can make a vote that's informed. And as I said, there's an a ethics and oaths each one of you had. You know what that spells out? It spells out responsibility. Have we got it now? Okay. If not, we'll just go with it. Um, 
some of you do get deferments, as I said at the last county meeting. And in those deferments, you don't pay as much taxes as other county people or other citizens. What I'm asking for is that we hold off on the schedule of values until you can understand what's coming up and what's going up and what's going down. Um, it's, it's, yep, that's it. Okay. We'll take it from the top. It'll, it'll be pretty quickly. Okay. All right. And this it? Yeah, it'll, it's, it's large. Okay. So what we want to show you is that if you would look at the problems in the tax department, okay, and then how do I flip it? Just press okay. All right. The schedule of values is a concept. Ethics oath is a responsibility. The corrections, evaluation is needed. Um, manufactured housing. It is the laws of North Carolina under General Statute 4720-6 and 4720-7. It actually calls for real property to be, to be a declaration to affix or a declaration with intention to affix. But there's a DMV law. This is North Carolina law, folks. It's called 20-1092. It says there's a surrender of title. There's a percentage of, of actual mobile homes in this county that are billed wrong, and I can prove it if you give us the time. It's going to take some time, but I have the files. Pete Byers on a parcel on Old River Road, he pays taxes on a building value at $335. William Stewart is probably a homeowner, and Mr. Byers is an investor. He pays on a building value of $59,000, and it's the same year, a 1992, and it's the same about the same square footage. Manufactured housing are real. The foreclosure on 942, it was wrong. It had a chattel loan. Under North Carolina law, chattel loans do not exist on real property. So Pitt County's wrong, but you foreclosed on him, folks, and he was disabled. Under Johnson Mill, I can take you to a dozen files, and I didn't have time to load them. If you went over on Bangkok, you would see that the housing value goes from 15,500 to 76,000 span for just a building value. Most of the land values are 3,400. And that was an evaluation of 25 lots. And these are mostly minority, but the interesting thing is, is that I'm not sure that you in the city are not using eminent domain and calling it tax collections. Deferments. Can close it up, Ms. Harris. Okay, sir. Under deferments are 663,481 uh, this year. That means that tax breaks were given to some 419,000. But the interesting thing, I want you to, problems in the tax department, these are collections. Now, under North Carolina law and under last month, you told the tax collector, go collect the taxes. Well, if you've got problems in collections, you've got problems in value, you've got problems in accuracy, how in the world can we lay our schedule of values on top of that? So I can tell you that I have the taxes that are due. This right here is actually the number of accounts. And when you can look at the number of accounts that are unpaid, the law doesn't say go collect the $50,000 ones. It doesn't say not to collect the $100 ones, that there's a lot of labor. It says equal and equitable. So what I'm saying to you tonight is that you're under an oath to understand the laws of North Carolina and to understand the laws of the United States under constitutional rights. And you, you look at me, and there's about 11 times I've stood before you. You need to know that all 11 times we're going in front of the federal government and we're asking why does the Constitution not exist in North Carolina in Pitt County? Because if it did, you would say, tell me more, Ms. Harris. You would say, I want to help the people that I was voted into. Or either you folks need to get the next piece of paper and write out a resignation because that's what it's going to come down to. God bless you and, and God bless America. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else on this issue? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. State your name. I'm on, the, you uh, I'm on the agenda under property taxes, but I think this fits pretty well. My name is Ron Lappert. Uh, I own the building at 1530 Evans Street. You probably know it as the Evans Office Mall. Now, I bought this building approximately five years ago, and it was taxed under the 04 schedule of values. And the tax at that time was about around $2,700 a year. 
And then the 08 schedule of values came out after I bought it, and the tax increased to well over $6,000 a year, a, a multiple of over 200%. And uh, I got to looking into this, and uh, I discovered that there's an awful lot of people that were assessed the same way I was. Uh, according to some figures that I came up with, uh, the 04-05 tax year had a, uh, a property value, net property value throughout the county of just a little over or a little under six billion five hundred million dollars. And then uh, after the uh, 208 uh, evaluation, that figure jumped to just a little under nine billion four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. An increase of roughly three billion dollars in property value uh, between the 04 and the 08 assessments, and it's the same property. And uh, I, I don't really think God's putting any more property in Pitt County, and you know nothing else shows up here. But and and let me remind you that this is a period of uh, depreciating property values. Property values are not appreciating during this period of time and they haven't been appreciating uh, since 08 and for the, the for the current uh, schedule of values. So the schedule of values that that should be coming out now should show some depreciation. Then I, I looked a little bit further to find out why I have to pay so much taxes and uh, and I looked into some records, and, and I think Ms. Harris touched on this, that there's an awful lot of people in the county that are paying taxes on property that's way, way, way undervalued, and some are not even paying at all. Some are pro completely deferred. And, and these, some of these property taxes have been deferred back for years, and when the time comes to pay these back taxes that have been deferred, they're only taxed at the sale of the property on the last three years of taxes. So that means if I own this property for 50 years and I've had a deferment for 50 years, I only owe seven years or three years of taxes on it. So uh, it looks to me like there's something drastically wrong here. And, uh, and what I'd like to do is put that before you, ladies and gentlemen, this evening and and ask you to look into this because uh, after all it's on your watch that this <coughs> is happening and uh, before my wife and I moved up here to Carolina we had a rather large automobile repair business in Florida and everybody in Florida knows that you have to go north to get to the deep south so here we are uh, and I had a secretary working for me there who liked to listen to a radio program uh, uh, put on by a Miss Dr. Laura Schlesinger. And she ended her program with a, with a line that I'd like to use. Uh, when she closed, she would say to everybody, uh, now go and do the right thing. And I would like to say that to you. Appreciate you your comment just uh, by way of a quick response to yes, some sir. of the things you said that's the purpose of having reevaluation every four years mm -hmm. is for these issues if there are discrepancies in it to be visited and I think when you have your reevaluation coming up shortly you'll have an opportunity at that time to present what you feel your concerns are and there are procedures for that but you can rest assured that our county attorney and our manager will respond if you've got something specific you want to give them about this thank appreciate you, you coming much. up thank you sir Anybody else? If not, uh, we declared the public hearing closed. And as all of you that sit up here with me know that tonight is an informational meeting and we will have uh, September the 12th is when this issue will actually be revisited and when it will be voted upon. <coughs> all right. Uh, Do we have to approve this? Not okay. tonight. Okay, no. that's what I, I was asking. I wasn't right. sure. Uh, James.
One final public hearing tonight, and this is for your 2011 voter district redistricting project. James, let me insert one thing. This being uh, information tonight, as I understand it, for the commissioners and for the Pitt County School Board. I've said noticed several members of the Pitt County School Board has come in, so they are participating from the same capacity that we are, James. Absolutely. Uh, also in attendance tonight is our outside legal counsel, Deborah Stagner, with uh, Therrington Smith from Raleigh, and she'll be available for any questions or comments you have also. We have a brief staff uh, presentation. Uh, I'll start it. Janice will chime in as necessary. Uh, again, what we want to do briefly before the public hearing is to uh, review some of the highlights of the current plan that's been out for uh, review. And again, just to remind you, Plan 1B is somewhat of a spinoff of Plan 1A. And uh, the result of changes to 1A was basically just to minimize any existing, any changes to the existing boundaries for the existing uh, voter districts. We'll also review the comments that have been um, brought to staff to date, and those are actually included in your package tonight, and uh, we'll be glad to answer any questions you might have about those. And some of the folks that actually uh, provided some comments are here in the audience tonight, too. Quickly, a reminder, the working assumptions that uh, we've agreed to in providing the uh, proposals to the board. Number one, the two primary working assumptions were federally, uh, federal requirements, and first one is the one person, one vote, um, equal protection clause. And again, we're trying to balance based off the 2010 census, trying to ensure that each district has a comparable number of uh, people residing in it. The second one, is the Voting Rights Act. And again, we're trying to ensure there is, there's not any retrogression occurring between last uh, 2001 or 2000 district lines and what the current proposal is. The other secondary working assumptions is the protection of incumbents within their current districts, the development of compact districts, and also the use of existing voter district or precinct boundaries where practicable. Uh, the, map that's shown in front of you tonight. There's also a map of uh, this particular proposal in the um, hallway leading into here and some handouts available tonight too. Looking at the map, you can see somewhat similar uh, boundary pattern as what we had previously. Uh, the statistics here, uh, very close. Remember, we have to be within a 10% deviation. Uh, our total deviation now is at 2.2. We started out very close to 36%. So needless to say, many people were moved from one district to another just to ensure that we meet that federal requirement of having a comparable, comparable number of people per district. Um, also, a uh, note here on this particular spreadsheet would be the black percentages in districts one and two. Those are our minority majority districts. And you can see district one has 55.7% black, district two 50.3 under the current proposal plan 1B. The overall highlights, again, I mentioned the deviation being very low. Um, the minority majority districts uh, have been maintained and possess greater than 50% black population in districts one and two. All the incumbents, all 21, the 12 from the Board of Education and the nine from the Board of Commissioners have been retained within their current boundaries, current districts. Uh, we believe that the districts are generally compact in design. And again, where we did make changes, we tried to ensure that we followed voter districts or precinct boundaries as best we could. Getting on to the public input portion, you may recall after your July 11th meeting, um, staff was authorized to um, begin the public input process. We've had a number of opportunities, both face-to-face -face and via uh, our county website. Also, the proposal was put on Opus for folks to look at, radio and talk shows, newspaper ads, and also our public input sessions. Also, on August 1st, we did make a presentation at the Board of Education in their first meeting here in this particular auditorium. So they have been briefed on this, uh, 
proposal as well. The input sessions, we uh, had five. Um, I'll say probably in close to two dozen people attended the sessions and they were held throughout the county. And um, Winterville, back in this auditorium, North Pitt High School, Farmville and Aiden Grifton. Two major comments that we received and we highlighted in your abstract tonight. Number one, the first concern was the division of Winterville into three voter districts. As you may recall, the town was divided into two previously. And also the desire to increase the percentage of blacks within the minority majority districts. Again, districts one and two. Our timeline, uh, holding the public hearing tonight, as we've mentioned all along, we do need to move forward with uh, adoption of a plan in time to ensure that we can get to the uh, Department, Board, Department of Justice in time for pre-clearance to meet the uh, first day of filing in February, actually February 13th, and election day is in May. So with that, Mr. Chairman, we've given a brief overview. The comments that we've uh, received today are in your package, and we open it up for public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Uh, I declare the public hearing open. Mr. Manager, do we have anyone signed up for this? Yes, sir. We have one person, Frank Morgan, who come forward, please. Come around, Mr. Morgan. Give your name, where you live, please. Thank you. My name is Frank Morgan. I live on Manhattan Avenue in the city of Greenville. And I come to address the min min minority majority districts. And for first, all, I want to start with District 1. It has the greatest deep deviation, population deviation, in the whole redistricting plan, 1.12%. District 1 include the re revitalization of the city of Greenville, which is losing population to the other districts. So if you start out low in that district to start with, and with the percentage being at 55%, you lose more people. And the people that you're losing are African American, you're going to reduce the percentage in that district even lower than 55%. And that doesn't even include the voting age population. And uh, District 2 percentage at 50.28, if they lose any people in the next 10 years, they're going to be below the 50% the, the like they are now, like they currently are. Well, District 2 is currently below 50%. So you'll be invited, and they, you, you don't go back and revisit during the 10 years. You didn't this past time, you didn't. So starting them out this low, you're going to end up with two districts that's not going to be uh, minority majority districts before the, the voting is over with. And on the, when we had the public comments, they told us to give specific be specific about the suggestion that we make. Well, we can't be specific about the suggestion that we make looking at this map because this map doesn't have any figures on it. All it tells us is the total figures. It doesn't tell us where any people live at in the districts. It doesn't show what section contain African Americans or what section do not. So we can't be specific in providing information when we don't have enough information to go on. And I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And when you talk about the voting age population, in the districts, it's already below 50% in District 1 uh, when, you, when you just look at that. And I'm sure somebody has done these figures, but we don't, I don't have access to them. And I would like to have them so we could, could provide specific what we think should be changed on it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Yeah. Anybody else that signed up for this, uh, Mr. Manager? No, sir. Now I offer an invitation from anyone present here tonight that had not signed up to come and speak to this issue. If so, you may come forward. Uh, there being no office, uh, I declare the public hearing open. Now the issue is closed. I've been corrected first time. But uh, we are closed now, and we're in a mode of discussion. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. McLawhorn, and then if the board has an input, then we'll ask the Board of Education to uh, have an input. Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, had a, a, quite an extensive conversation with Mr. Morgan and some of the uh, other organization, uh, Enough is, is Enough, uh, the NAACP, and uh, uh, the uh, African American, the African -American uh, Caucus, and uh, they were very concerned with the concerns that was raised by Ms. Mr. Morgan. I would like, I think you mentioned that, Mr. Rose, that, that the attorney uh, in planning this is here. 
uh, from Raleigh, I'd like to uh, ask her to come forward to the podium and address some of these concerns that was raised by Mr. Morgan and if anybody, because those, those concerns certainly concerns me. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Deborah Stagner here from Therrington Smith. It's nice to be back with you all and members of the Board of Education. Um, I will just address in a couple of different, from a couple of different points of view about the conundrum that the boards are facing in, in this process. And the first step that you are looking at is to equalize the population, which Mr. Rhodes and, and the staff has done with, with redrawing these, these maps. But close on the heels of that, you have got to um, ensure that there is no retrogression from the current existing plan um, in order to obtain preclearance from the Justice Department. Um, retrogression is a comparison um, well, first of all, the, the Justice Department will look at it to make sure that there's no purpose or effect of discrimination in the redistricting plan, the change of your method of election. Uh, retro retrogression means they look at it to ensure that even if there's no intentional discrimination, that there's no effect of reducing the ability of minority voters to exercise their electoral franchise. And so, in other words, that it's not more difficult under the proposed plan to elect members uh, or to elect candidates of their choice um, than it is under the current plan. And in order to do that, the Justice Department will look at the benchmark, which is the last legally enforceable plan, which is the plan that you currently have. That was pre-cleared. It's the one in existence. And as um, has been pointed out by the speaker, that District 2 currently is below 50 percent African American population in District 2 um, based on the last legally enforceable plan um, because of changes in the population that currently is below 50 percent. Um, but that's, that's the starting point of what the Justice Department will compare the new plan to. Um, there's no predetermined or fixed percentage that uh, is required for preclearance. The Justice Department doesn't have a target number that you have to have. It's a comparison between the current plan and the proposed plan. Um, the census numbers obviously are the important starting point, but the Justice Department also looks at other data to help um, understand what the facts on the ground, so to speak, what in fact is the actual voting um, ability uh, ability to elect of this minority population. And so starting with the census data, they also will look at electoral data, voter registration and voting patterns in order to um, see whether there's retrogression. Um, with all that being said, uh, sex, Section 5 preclearance does not guarantee that the plan cannot be challenged either by the Justice Department on some other basis or by a private party that decides to challenge the plan um, because of some other constitutional or statutory problem. So this is where you have the balancing act um, because the Equal Protection Clause of the Federal Constitution says that any classification solely on the basis of race is inherently suspect and must be narrowly tailored to meet a compelling government interest. So our courts have said and the Supreme Court has said that Section 5 preclearance can be a compelling government interest, governmental interest, but any plan that takes race into account to achieve preclearance has to be narrowly tailored in order to meet that. And so, in, in essence, what the Supreme Court has said, I'll get the exact language, um, that Section 5 doesn't give carte blanche for racial gerrymandering and that reapportionment has to be narrowly tailored to avoid retrogression but can't go beyond what's necessary to avoid retrogression. So that's the background sort of legal framework that um, the jurisdiction, the county, and the Board of Education are uh, constrained by in order to come up with the plan. And so thinking back on those different factors that I talked about, um, <coughs> It is true that in District 1, the current total African American population is 57.25%. The proposed uh, plan has a black population of 55%. Um, 18 plus voting age goes from 52.17 to 50.58. It doesn't drop below 50%, but that's voting age. Registered voters, currently 58%, and these are some numbers that um, we, I just received uh, this evening, the proposed plan for District 1 would still have 55.96 percent 
of the registered voters are African American. So there's still a majority of registered voters under the proposed plan. But taking that one step further and looking at District 1, the voter turnout has been extremely high among African Americans as opposed to white registered voters. Um, and so the actual turnout over the last decade has been 60, almost 65 percent to 83 percent um, of the turnout among voters in that district have been African American. So again, this is what the Justice Department will be looking at, that actual electoral behavior. Um, <coughs> District 2 has actually increased the numbers from below 50 percent to above 50 percent in um, both the total population and the registered voters. Um, currently in District 2, registered voters that are African American, 53.8 percent of total registered voters. That increases to 54.28 percent under the proposed plan. Voter turnout total for District 2 has not been as high. Uh, African Americans have not been a majority of, even though they're a majority of registered voters, have not been a majority of the actual turnout um, in most of the elections, a couple of the, of the elections over the past decade. So all that is to say that it's not necessary for preclearance and it's not necessary to avoid retrogression to sort of boost up those numbers higher. I understand certainly the concern that if you lose population over the decade that it may drop below 50 percent and that's certainly something um, that, that could raise a concern, but it's not what the Justice Department is looking at for preclearance at this time. Um, if it's possible to increase that within the um, realm of other legitimate redistricting considerations like um, natural boundaries, like um, uh, um, precinct lines, um, historical voting um, divisions like municipalities, those types of things that are uh, compactness, cont uh, contiguity. Those are general redistricting principles. And so long as race does not predominate above all of those other things, um, above and beyond what's necessary to meet retrogression, then uh, you're probably not likely to face a challenge. But um, you start to tread on a, a little bit riskier ground in facing a challenge if you go beyond what's necessary to avoid retrogression. I think that the plan, certainly I can't speak to what the Justice Department will do, but I think based on my experience and what I've seen in other plans that are pre-cleared, that this should satisfy the non-retrogression standard. Um, so what you're looking at is whether it's possible to draw a plan that includes more African American population in those two districts while still complying with the other principles of redistricting so that race doesn't predominate above and beyond what the Constitution, the Equal Protection uh, Clause will allow. And I'm happy to explain any of that. I just wanted to... Um, well, uh, if I could just take it a step further, you know, certainly, you know, I'm, 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 I'm one commissioner for fairness and, 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 and being equal and, 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 and considerate of all. But, you know, when you look at the existing districts, uh, you have District uh, 3, 72.9% uh, is white, 55%, 72.3%, and 70% going on down. Uh, then you compare that with the existing a black population of District 1 and 2 is 57.3 and 48.9 has already been, been alluded to. Now, I understand that the population of white as compared to blacks here in Pitt County is 66%, I think, white and 33% black. And so that's going to be a difficult challenge in dealing with that. You know, my, my, my question to you, and again, keeping in mind of, 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 of being practical and, and, and in fairness and being um, uh, being uh, equal, trying to do the right thing. You, we talk about gerrymandering. That's not um, that, that 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 the Justice Department pro probably would not consider. My 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 question here, that if you if you if you're considering that and doing the right thing, the proper thing, and being fair, then gerrymandering may be not a bad thing to bring. If if you if you felt far away, I'm going with this. I think that, 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 that there's a reality and a practical way of, of gerrymandering if you're doing it fair. Uh, so this is where the, the, the various uh, 
my constituents and, and the various uh, organization that has met with me has talked about maybe we need to jump to a predominantly black area to bring this population up so that this so that you will have fairness and, and I, I and I know that's gerrymandering but at the same time can that be done well again it, the um it's, it's not necessary. The Justice Department doesn't necessarily say that you can't go and reach out and, and um, sort of pick up minor small pockets of minority population in order to um, meet that non-retrogression standard. Um, but in this case, I believe that that has been met, that this plan is not retrogressive. So that, you know, meeting that first test for the Justice Department, it wasn't necessary to sort of draw bizarrely shaped districts to reach out and grab. Not that there's, that's on, on its face, maybe what you have to do in order to not be retrogressive. In some um, jurisdictions where the minority population is so dispersed and so diffuse that you cannot achieve that same level of uh, population that you had before without going out and, and expanding the, the district. Um, in this case, they, there is, um, a maintain a maintenance of a majority ability a majority minority ability in district one with being well over 50 percent in district two it's increased from what the benchmark is because the bench, benchmark could actually drop below so I believe that the current plan um, is is not retrogressive and the Justice Department would likely find that it was not retrogressive um, so the question then is can you go above and beyond what the Justice Department is going to require to sort of raise those levels up, raise those percentages up, and then you run in, in the risk of having this equal protection claim if race is the only reason that you've gone out. If there are other reasons to expand and redistrict, like um, maintaining these communities or a, a, a following a natural boundary or an artificial municipal boundary or something like that, um, then you've got more of a a balanced um, reason for changing the districts and, and just because the population and the minority population has increased, race hasn't predominated overall. Um, but there is just that challenge of taking into account race enough but not too much and, and, and sort of this tension between what the Justice Department's requiring for retrogression and what an Equal Protection Clause would require. If someone were to challenge it, it may not be challenged but it, there's a risk out there if you go too far. Um, so I'm not there, and I don't know the, you know, what other uh, maps were considered. If there were, my understanding is that this was as high as it could go with following those uh, those general other redistricting principles. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I'm David Hammond. I am the commissioner that has represented District One since December of 1998. And before this meeting today, one of the ladies that has voted for me every election since then wanted to know why they're carving the heart out of my district to increase the numbers in District 2. And I told them because of redistricting. That's, that's the only answer I gave her. But she's looking and listening tonight, and maybe you and Mr. Rose later on can give her a a better answer than that. I gave it the simple way that I knew how to give it. They said that my district and District 2 both needed minority, more minorities in it to what you call. She said, well, why are they getting them from somewhere else instead of taking a whole section of your district to increase the numbers in another minority district? Well, and that's the um, the dilemma that you run into if you are trying to increase, for example, District 2 further above 50 percent and there's no um, obvious... Well, Mr. Agner, when I first okay. was elected, my district ran from south of Tar River to Greenville Boulevard, uh, Center Line, and then go on the south side of Greenville Boulevard. But now, the district has left the real one, and, and the boundary is 3rd Street to 5th Street that they are taking out of the district now to add numbers. That is from West 3rd to 5th and from Memorial to Green. In other words, District 2 is 
or another minority district supposed to be predominantly white, but as Mr. Morgan said, the voting ages in those districts may not reflect what the numbers reflect, or at least the, 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 the historical voting pattern might not reflect that. And so this is one of the my very best supporters, one of the very best supporters. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think Mr. Rhodes may be able to address why certain areas right. were selected. I guess first I need to know where she resides. Make sure I'm looking at the right area. She was, she resides not far from the Elks Recreation Center. In between 3rd and 5th Streets then? Yes, sir. I and I think I mentioned that to the board the last time we were here. To ensure we got the percentage of blacks as high as possible and meeting these other criteria we've been dealing with as high as possible in District 3, the area between, or District 2, I should say, the area between 3rd and 5th Streets was critical in moving that to the District 2. That is a high concentration of blacks in that area, in excess of 85%. By moving that block of folks into District 2, it bumped it up above 50%. So that is a critical section, and we've uh, mentioned that previously. Finish, Dave. Any other questions, Dave? Mm -mm. I'll be right. to Does any other member of the board want to comment, uh, Mr. Gass? I'd like to. Uh, for us to address the other issue that was presented during the public hearings, and that is the issue of dividing Winnable into three districts. Now, I realize that that area is one of the fastest growing areas in the county, and keeping it whole is a challenge, but that is a very close-knit community. They take a lot of pride in their community, and uh, the uh, input from the public, public hearings and the input that I am receiving from citizens over there in Winnable is that they're concerned about being divided into three districts. They were previously into two districts, but that second district that Winnable was involved in, it, it included a very small number of people. And now they are three districts and it includes some fairly large areas that are drawn out of the district that the majority of the citizens of Winnable uh, are in. So um, I would like to know, is it practical to meet the criteria that this board has set forth and still draw a district whereby Winnable could remain whole? That's a, another question for James, I believe. Mm -mm. The main driving force with this is to retain the incumbents within those district lines. So if we forego that particular assumption, it is possible to retain winner. It is possible. It's still going to be a ripple effect because we will be moving a tremendous folk, amount of folks out of the Greenville portion of District 5 into other districts. So there will be a ripple effect all in the southern part of the county as to which districts uh, are adjusted. So, are you saying then that it is impossible to draw a district and keep winnable whole and maintain the criteria, the premises that this board has developed at the beginning of this process? I believe that to be true. We have not been able to come up with a scenario to meet that requirement. Okay, well, can you uh, draw a district that would put Winnable in no more than two districts and maintain that criteria? Still would be additional changes to those districts south of the river, a possibility maybe, but it still may affect at least an incumbent or two. Well, so you, you're saying that what we have in Plan 1B is uh, – the best you believe that we can draw given the premises and making sure that we abide by all the criteria of the Justice Department? I do believe that true. The staff attorney and I have reviewed it quite a number of times and to ensure that we've got a balance across all these different working assumptions, we believe this to be the optimum plan. Can it be tweaked? 
A little, yes. But if we start moving substantial numbers of people from one district to another, it, it will have a ripple effect. I'd like to ask our outside objective advisor, do you agree with what he said? Well, and I apologize. I know the answer yeah. to that. Well, I have, I me, have. I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, I have been providing legal advice on the preclearance and the equal protection and, and those one person, one vote. So I have not drawn any maps myself. Um, so I'm relying on what um, James and uh, uh, Ms. Um, Gallagher have said that their experience in drawing the maps. I haven't sat down and tried to draw a map myself. That wasn't, you know, we're, uh, we were retained to give the legal advice on the uh, passage of preclearance of the plan and that type of thing, whether it met the legal requirements. As far as practical considerations of how you might fit in the lines, um, I've been relying on James. He's, we've asked the question and he said, it's, you know, gave the answer he just gave you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Gares? Uh, Mr. Webb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is obviously a, a complex issue, and, and my issue with this is that uh, no matter how a municipality is divided, uh, I have, and it was raised in a letter to us about uh, both me and, and you, Mr. Chairman, whether or not we would equally represent the interests of the people of Winterville versus Farmville or Aden, and the answer to that is no, I will equally represent the interest of every citizen in Pitt County because I'm not a Winterville commissioner or Aiden commissioner. I'm a Pitt County commissioner. And the oath I took was to serve the people of this county regardless of address and where they live. So I think that all of us believe that and that no matter your address, you will get equal service despite uh, who your commissioner is, what your commissioner's address is, or what your commissioner looks like. No matter who you call, whether it's me or Mr. Chairman or Melvin, they're going to give you the best service you can. And uh, I think this is a compact plan. I think to divert otherwise is going to cause a lot of uh, movement, especially during election time, of going here, there, and everywhere, especially if you look at District 6. Uh, that will grow it either north or west, and it's already a very large district with respect to the fact that Winterville is the fastest growing area of our community. I would just like to assure them that they will get equal time and access with their issues because, again, I don't serve on any municipal board. I serve on the county board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, sir. If there's no other comments from the Board of Commissioners, I now invite the members of the Board of Education that are present. If you have some question or some desire to address the attorney or our planning board or this board. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for coming. Yes, sir. Did you? Oh, excuse me. Thank you, sir. Uh, appreciate the presentation that's been made here now. Uh, what is the pleasure of the board in regarding the resolution that's before you? I'll motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. All right. Is there a second? I second it. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Not, Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Moore. Uh, you know, just in, in light of all the my constituents and, and the comments that was made by uh, Mr. Morgan and all I, I I can't at this time approve that this plan. Oh, it's understandable. That's fine. Uh, any other discussion? If not, uh, let's vote. All right, that's your answer. Next order of business, Mr. Manager. Next order is presentation item number seven. This will be for recognition of um, two Eagle Scouts. And actually, we had a number of Scouts who were being recognized but couldn't attend. We have, um, of the total list, we have Philip Horn for Troop 9, Ian Barrick, Troop 200, Thomas Bass, Troop 46, Wesley Hogue, Troop 30, Michael Phillips, Troop 9, and, and Austin Needham, Troop 30. We do have uh, Mr. Needham here tonight, and we have um, Thomas Morgan Bassett tonight. Ms. Ward's going to assist you in this presentation. Beth thinks there might be three out of there, Scott. Are there three scouts here or just two?
he did number ten. We all recognize the Eagle Scouts, actually Boy Scouts, who scored the rank of Eagle. Nationally, it said that 2% of the Boy Scouts of America actually achieved this rank in 10 counties for 3-4%. So tonight, if um, Thomas Morgan Bass will come forward with his family, we'll um, recognize you first. Anyone else with him that would friends. like to come up, join friends, Scoutmaster. family, Scoutmaster, be with me. I'd like the motion we approve these resolutions. Second. All right, ready to vote. Here you go, Beth. Jimmy, get Beth. Thank you. Okay, Thomas. Thank Thomas, you, Mr. Do you want me to read? Oh, sure. okay. I thought you'd been here. Uh, I'll be is this a trick? Hey, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do so <laughs> it is uh, titled Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Thomas Morgan Bass for achieving the Eagle Scout Award. His project he planted and or replanted 30 or more wax mortals on newly acquired land at River Park North. It's presented by the Pitt County Board of Commissioners this 22nd day of August 2011. Signed by our chairman, Mark Owens Jr. And I will say that later. Okay. Um, I would like to make a re request if it's too much to ask. I didn't plant 30 trees, I planted 45. And it still wasn't enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> I would like to make a request to help out another one of my scouts who's looking to do the same project. It's the same deal. He just wants the same amount of trees to do it at the same spot. I was hoping that you could donate 40 wax myrtle trees to him. If it's too much to ask, I understand. He'll know where to go to find them. <laughs> you tell him to get in touch with Dr. Trump. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Yes, if you don't get it, you come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have Austin Austin Needham will come forward. Your family. Let me read your sticker for you. Certificate of appreciation is awarded to Austin Magnum Needham. Is that pronounced it correctly? For achieving the Eagle Scout Award as well. The project, he landscaped the new the new planting beds around Jarvis and Methodist Church. And this is presented this 22nd day of August 2011 in South Carolina. Congratulations. to your seats. Uh, some of you might not know this, but our distinguished board member, uh, Melvin McLawhorn, is also an Eagle Scout. Melvin, you want to uh, enhance him with your wisdom? No, I just want to congratulate, congratulate all of you. This is a great achievement, and uh, you have a lot of work still ahead of you, and I wish you well and, and success in any of your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you for your good work. All right, Mr. Manager. Next, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, we have the um, public addresses to the board. We did have two people sign up. They've already spoken to other matters, unless they want to come up and speak again, I guess. Good. I believe that take care of it. What's next? Okay. Next, you have um, items to report. And those, first item is, is mine on there, the manager's report. Next meeting date of September 12th at 9 a.m. here in your meeting room, then October 3rd at 9 a.m. Also, item B. So we'll make you aware that the health department is going to have a key leaders breakfast for their program, the CPPW, which is, the, which is Communities Putting Prevention to Work. This will be September the 8th from 7.30 to 9.30 at Rock Springs. This will be a, a breakfast, and um, the commissioners are invited to this. The clerk, I believe, will be following up to find out the interest of which commissioners may want to attend. Um, next item, item C, is the announcement for the ECVC Banquet, Eastern Carolina Vocational Center. This will be held on Thursday, October 6th at 7 p.m. And again, this will be held at Rock Springs as well. Um, item D on the list, um, the PGV, the Pitt Greenville um, Airport audit that was conducted by the Office of State Auditor. Obviously, that has been released. Um, that has received um, press coverage um, 
television coverage as, as well. Just want to make the board aware that the um, a representative from the auditor's office, David Nance, will be meeting with myself and the city manager, Wayne Bowers, to go over the report, um, I guess, on two on one um, basis in the near future. But we um, have received that and are taking the findings into consideration as to um, change that we need to recommend and help the their port authority with. Uh, Mr. Manager. Yes, sir. If anyone would be interested, they can go to the Office of State Editor, uh, Auditor website and print out the whole report. That is correct. Anything else, Mr. Manager? Yeah, a few other items. Um, item <laughs> E, uh, Commissioner Hammond asked me to announce that the Golden Living Center has been acknowledged for the Silver Quality Award for nursing care, and um, just wanted to have that be brought out. Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to... Uh, Advise board that I'm a resident there at Golden Living Center now and has been for several months. And there are 325 of those centers in North Carolina out of approximately 460 nursing facilities. And they received this award, the 24 Carat Award. And also, I would like to recognize their generous contribution to the Broder School of Medicine of $116,435 uh, the Golden Living Center made that made that uh, presentation to their, direct, uh, their executive director Hal Garland <coughs> to uh, the school's president uh, chairman uh, Dr. Cunningham and they have made contributions to that center for the past 30 years and it continues to be the choice of most of the short and long-term uh, residents that are in Pitt and surrounding counties and they are serving a population with 152 beds that stays full most of the time. Thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Chairman, item F on the agenda, update regarding the Moywood Drive, Moywood Drive extension. As you recall, this project has been discussed for well over a year. Probably last time I reported to the board is probably um, early spring on this project. I had been in contact with um, the two NCDOT board members, North Carolina Department of Transportation, regarding this, and had calls, and then finally actually um, wrote them a letter because I really wasn't getting much movement from the phone calls. And um, in early summer, wrote them a letter basically outlining the request that the, the Moywood Drive extension project, again, is the, the project that is would bring Moywood Drive across Fifth Street into the county office complex. And um, eventually the, the concept was to have a, a traffic light there to, um, I guess, mitigate the, the changes that have been installed along Fifth Street that makes ingress and egress into this property um, not as easy as it once was when the traffic island was not in front. Um, from that, a uh, conference call was held um, about the week of um, August the 8th, and um, the DOT board member as well as staff was involved in this, this conference call. And basically what we're being told is that DOT's position on this has not changed, and that the request was to ask DOT to fund the installation of the traffic signal at the same time that the construction improvements were put into place. DOT is telling us, and even through the DOT board member, that, um, that it could not take place at the same time that after the construction <coughs> is, is done, that they then could do it immediately. They could do a, a traffic light study where they would do counts for approximately six weeks. And they would also consider tying this into a corridor study going down from Bees Barbecue Road up to Memorial Drive to see how they may coordinate the signalization of, of all the signals along there. The, the important piece on this project that I think we've kind of moved backwards on is the funding. We were initially told that the funding would, would be come out of a special contingency pot of money from DOT for the, it's about a quarter of a million dollars to actually do just the, the road construction without the light. We're now being told at, at this meeting that DOT is, is saying that the funding would have to come out of the county secondary road construction money, which this year is about $1.3 million. Um, that would be a quarter of a million or $300,000 that could not be used out in the county on county roads for secondary road improvements. Um, so that's kind of where we are on the, at this point in time. The, um, the traffic light, again, would be a, a second component down the line. 
If the board is interested in doing this, we would need to communicate back to DOT. They will be coming to you in the next month or two as they develop the secondary road improvement program, which they present to you, you have input on, and then you adopt as to how those dollars are used and where they're used. So if that is something of interest to the board, we do need to communicate ba that back. I to think them. they messed the system up so much in the beginning when they did the planning, and we tried to give some resolution to it, and we've got no answer at all from it. Uh, and I don't know what the traffic pattern, and Glenn, you the city might know that, but if nothing's been wrong with the traffic pattern, I'd, I'd withdraw it and tell them to forget it. There's I one member. We haven't seen any issues with it. Right. Excuse me. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Dave. I failed to admit when I was making speaking relative to the Golden Living Center that they have a community advisory board in which Ms. Alice King of Pitt County Community School and Recreation serves as a member, as a board member, and has served for quite some time. And several other outstanding citizens in Pitt County. Thank you again, Dave. Scott? Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a few other things not on the agenda. One, wanted to announce to the board that we've received from NACO, the National Association of Counties, that there will be a, um, a nationwide county remembrance for 9-11 on 9-11-2011. This will be entitled Stop and Remember. This will take place at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on this date. Basically, this is a time to stop and remember those who were lost in the sub September the 11th attacks. And this calls for counties, cities, and towns across America to sound um, sirens and ring bells at 1 p.m. And I've given information to the, the board in the agenda packet and also to department heads. This year, Sunday, September the 11th, is actually a Sunday. It'll be on a weekend. But um, there is a, a national observance being planned for that. Well taken. Do we need to do anything on that now? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Um, another item, just want to give a quick report as to the NCACC conference that um, myself, the county attorney, Commissioner Webb, Commissioner McLawhorn, Commissioner Johnson, and Commissioner Ward, Vice Chairman Ward attended um, this past Thursday through through Sunday. Um, basically, it was a very good conference, and there were a lot of um, um, work breakout sessions. Um, some of the ones I found of, of value. One was on actual um, reevaluation, and pretty much gave me confidence in what our tax administrator is doing and the staff in terms of how reevaluation is being implemented. They discussed the schedule of values and how that is handled um, in terms of what you did tonight with the public hearing, what you'll do through adoption, what can be done for the appeals, and, and so Where forth. There are other workshops on one man, one vote, redistricting. Again, another timely topic that we're dealing with right here in Pitt County. Uh, another topic was on social networking, such as tweeting, Facebook, and, and the like. And there were many other topics. I don't know if any of the other uh, the attorney or the commissioners have anything they'd like to report out. Any further comments from the board? I just went to a session on uh, coalition working cooperatively with other jurisdictions and within your own county with other government entities. And I was able to share some things that we had done in Pitt County and heard some other things and some other ideas. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to talk about the ethics training. <laughs> this is a this is a very uh, good training program, and, and I think it's very important that we continue to uh, understand that there's a seriousness throughout Pitt County about ethics. Uh, that, that, that I'm sure some of you have read uh, over the uh, news, heard over the news and read in the paper that there are some people that are not ethical uh, as, uh, as they should be. So uh, I, I'd like to just say that this is very, very important. This is a year that I think they are watching and people have been very conscious in watching others in, in their ethical behavior. So that, that, is, that is a concern that uh, I thought was well attended. I thought the conference was well, well, very well attended. And, uh, and I think Pitt County, as compared to some of the other counties, are faring well uh, in, 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 this, uh, in North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, William? Mr. Chairman, just a few things. Uh, we attended a meeting uh, done by a demographer and, and we see how fortunate we are in Pitt County. We're one of the few counties in the east that's actually experiencing growth and having positive birth rates and things. And, and what that means is is that we are replenishing our population. People are still locating here. And there's a lot of counties and a lot of them that touch our borders that aren't doing the same thing. And also, just on a, a side note, another experience I had with our Pitt County 4-H club 
is uh, how blessed Pitt County is with its young people. We saw an example of that with our Eagle Scouts, but again with our 4-H, uh, they're engaged and they're not just attending these things and, and watching us, they're taking proactive steps, they're having their own meetings, they're coming up with their own solutions to issues that are facing the youth uh, right here in Pitt County and statewide. And they did an amazing job while they were there and uh, they give you a lot of hope for the, for the next generation and, and they have plans to attend some of our meetings and become more engaged on the local level, so we'd obviously welcome that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Dr. Johnson? Not at this time. Anybody else on this issue? Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I would like to recognize that Dr. Johnson was, was honored and recognized at the banquet on Saturday night for a county commissioner in the 20-year-plus um, category, and I believe he was the only commissioner at the statewide conference that was recognized for that, that recognition. Very good. Nice, nice. Um, just a couple of other items real quick. Um, the Pitt County Health Department has applied for a grant for the from the North Carolina Public Health Association for the Ann Wolf Grant. This is a $5,000 grant to continue their support for a preconception health awareness campaign among local businesses and churches. I'm just announcing this because they didn't get it on the agenda and the policy just states I need to bring it to your, to your attention. Um, the animal shelter quickly is going to have on September the 11th from 2 to 5 p.m. an open house and an adoption event. This will include a rapies and microchip clinic um, and this will be at the county animal shelter on County Home Road and if it, the public has any questions they can call um, into the county offices at 902-3000 for any questions that they may have. And one last item, um, as the board is aware we are in the midst of implementing through the, the approval of contracts as such the radio um, system for the, the county one of the, the subcomponents of that was releasing an RFP for the paging system, which we did release that, put that out for bid, received bids. We only received one bid, and that bid is not compliant with what our engineer, federal engineering, is telling us what we need. So the, um, this is being walked on, I realize, but I'm just making that, this announcement that, that the county needs to reject the bid on that and allow us to, to rebid the project. I believe that's within the chairman's authority to, to do that, but I thought it would be prudent to make the announcement publicly as well. Just one other item, I don't really know if it do, needs any discussion. Obviously, the board saw in the paper the, the, cha the name change on PCMH, Pitt County Memorial Hospital. Um, the news release didn't come to the county, and actually we weren't, haven't really been notified officially. I've had some informal conversations with um, um, the executive staff of the hospital, but that, that is in the, the works and in the making, and um, just bring that to your attention even though you're well aware of it. But with that, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. All right, uh, James, I believe you're back again. And while he's coming out to make some presentation, this is just for uh, information only. Go ahead, James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Planning Board has set a series of five um, public forums for our land use plan update. You may recall we've been out for our first series of public forums when we were gathering information. After collecting that information, we now have a final draft that we want to present, and we have a final draft map. So we're going back out again to uh, various areas in the community to get additional comment on the final draft plan and map. Uh, this starts next week on August the 30th at Stokes, followed by a meeting on September the 1st at Aiden Grifton, on the 8th at Chicago, 13th in Bell Arthur, and the 15th will wrap up in Belvoir. And again, this is an open house type setting starting at 5 o'clock running to about 7 o'clock with a uh, staff presentation around 630 so we invite everyone to come out this will be going to a public hearing sometime in October with our planning board and back before the commissioners later this year so I uh, just want to make you aware of those dates and they are including your package tonight thank you mr. chairman thank you Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Day. Uh, following the uh, state conference in Concord, a uh, state representative called me and said that it's not many times that he comes to Pitt County or read our paper on the Internet that he didn't see that there was some municipality in the county having a festival, an annual festival. And we're, our county is one of the few counties that I know that several of the municipal palaces have an annual festival. Thank you, Dave. All right, tax collector. Most recently, Fountain having peanut festival and uh, Winterville, the watermelon festival, Aiden, Collard festival, Grifton, the shad festival, and uh, most of the 
it's not many counties around east or west that has that many municipalities within their county having an annual festival every year and formed with the dogwood festival and and on and on thank you ma'am go ahead you have the um july 2011 tax collection report in that report um it will show that we are slightly ahead of last year at this same time and i'm here to answer any questions if you have any questions about the collection report do we have a motion to approve motion this to approve report? report second let's vote thank you ma'am thank you okay we're now in our consent consent agenda Motion approved. No, no. Second. Well, we, we did that. More. Okay. I've since I led you astray. Okay. Let's vote on that. Okay. Consent agenda. Thank you, Mel. All right. Now, the legislative goals, uh, Janice, and then the next one is Janice. Yes, and I'll be brief with you. I wanted to provide an interim progress report on our legislative goals in earlier this year before the 2011 12. Um, biennial session of the General Assembly went into effect, you adopted um, some goals that are on page 64 of your packet. And I've provided to you in your um, agenda package an update as to each of those goals. And it looks so far that Pitt County has fared very well in the goals that we have established and set. Um, and I would say that's due in part to the hard work of, of uh, many members of your staff and our close connection and association with the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners who also provided great support to accomplish um, the goals that we have so far. You'll also see that these goals require continuing effort and that there are some goals on your list that we're continuing to work toward. But I am pleased to say that with regard to general revenue protection, Pitt County has fared fairly well. We have successfully, in my opinion, preserved our existing local revenue base, including our quarter cent sales tax that was voted in by the people and um, many efforts um, have minimized potential impact to Pitt County and the other counties um, in the state as it relates to existing revenue uh, sources that come to local government. With regard to the ABC board, which was one of your goals to oppose any efforts to privatize the ABC system, the governor was in line with that goal uh, earlier this year. and. Um, Together, Pitt County, along with the Association of County Commissioners and the Governor, did successfully oppose efforts to privatize the ABC system, and we have retained our statutory authority to receive all net profits from a locally controlled ABC system. With regard to E911 funds, we're continuing to support this goal. Collective bargaining, we were successful in avoiding any action in that arena. Transportation funding has been one that we have been successful to date, but will continue to watch very closely. Um, there was no uh, legislation introduced um, to shift secondary road responsibility to counties, um, but we'll continue to watch that closely. Um, uh, Secretary Conti has a developed a um, good relationship with the Association of County Commissioners. At our recent conference this weekend, um, we also had a presentation from Bo Memory with the Department of Transportation, and he, pro he provided um, realistic uh, information with regard to where we're looking in terms of roads. Um, we need to keep an eye on what happens with the gas tax because it's that gas tax that funds the secondary road funds. Um, we need, can watch their aggressive uh, efforts towards bridges, um, which seems to be the focus of the Department of Transportation right now, and we can work with them as we watch their continued cuts to secondary road funding um, for maintenance. Um, but he did say this weekend as well, that it is not the Department of Transportation's intent to shift responsibility for roads to counties. They believe we have an effective system in place and we'll continue to work together. Um, I'm not sure that the uh, majority in the General Assembly feels the same way, so we'll watch that closely. Um, we were successful in accomplishing your next goal, which has to do with local electronic offender monitoring programs. And as you'll recall, um, prior to the initiation of this session, we had suspended fees that were charged to help the county recoup its cost in running that program. We now have, as a result of a, uh, a statewide bill that was introduced by Representative Bill Cook, immediately following our legislative breakfast earlier this year with him, um, that allows all counties in North Carolina um, to recoup their actual cost for inmate electronic monitoring. And so counties have the authority now, if they choose to, um, to impose a fee uh, to yeah, run those programs. 
uh, publication of delinquent taxes electronically um, was one of your goals. That met significant resistance from the Press Association. The concern is that it would limit access um, of information to folks in rural areas, and it also would have a negative impact um, on print newspapers themselves. Um, so we have, uh, we will continue to support this goal, um, but that will take significant time, I think, before you'll see any real movement on it. Uh, interest on delinquent taxes, we continue to support that, and that's pending. And relief from overcrowding at the animal shelter, we made some movement with regard to that goal, and that has to do with um, clarifying uh, proof of ownership when animals are surrendered to relieve overcrowding at the animal shelter. Um, we met great resistance from animal control, animal rights activists. Um, I think we will wind up with some sort of compromise um, legislation at the end of the day that gets us some of what we want but protects the interests of those animal rights activists as well. So we'll continue to work on that closely. Um, but I'll continue to monitor uh, these items for you and provide updates um, as the information becomes available. Thank you, ma'am. Let's move now to uh, for Janice, the next item. Uh, I'm pleased to advise you that we have a full class for our next session of the Pitt County Citizens Academy. Um, it will begin next or um, two Tuesdays from now, Tuesday, September 6th, the Tuesday after Labor Day. Um, we will run a six-week session um, reviewing the county departments with our citizens. This has been an award-winning program um, that has gotten uh, very good reviews from those who have participated in it. Um, I remind you, especially this evening, because um, I again invite each of you to participate in those first night's events. Uh, in looking at the reviews from prior participants, one of the most meaningful parts of the Citizens Academy was their ability to see you in person, meet you in person, and interact with you that first night. Um, so I know there may be scheduling conflicts, um, but work with me on those because if, if it's not the first night, we'd like to get you in over the course of the six weeks. But I do ask you to please add Tuesday, September 6th at 6 p.m. in this room on your calendars um, so that you can be introduced uh, to the folks in that class. We're looking forward to another great session. You have one of the assistant district attorneys is going to take the class. That's correct, we do. Um, and I am very pleased that in this class we have reached out and received folks from all over Pitt County. Um, we've got Farmville, we've got Aiden, um, we've got Young, we've got Mature. And um, so I think we will have a, uh, a great experience um, over the next six weeks. That's better than the way Glenn puts in there. <laughs> she sounds like a politician rather than that. <laughs> All right. Next, we get down to the item for the decision, Mr. Manager. Yes, next item is the fire district report. If um, Noel Lee will come forward, please. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, I like that mature part. Uh, that was good. Um, the commissioners had asked the county staff to gather some information for the um, helped you in the creation of fire service districts for all 20 fire departments uh, or fire districts and within the county. Uh, what we've presented to you tonight are some of the points that you need to address as we move forward in the legal process and the creation of fire service districts. What's being passed around to you now is the map that was in your agenda packet that I know you couldn't read, but again, trying to make one a little bit larger that you can see of the actual different districts. In the legal process tonight, what we need to do is present to you, and this is presented to you in the spreadsheet, is the resident population of proposed county service districts, appraised value of the property subject to taxation, present tax rates, uh, ability of proposed county service districts to sustain uh, additional taxes, and any other relative matters to the Board of Commissioners. In the uh, spreadsheet that was presented to you tonight, we have addressed these items. Um, I will tell you that on Simpson, if you look at their current fiscal year 11, 12, it's listed as six cent. That is a correction, it is five cent. Um, we did last Wednesday night meet with all the fire departments and presented this information to them. Um, Scott was with us, Janice was with us, uh, Alan, and basically, um, the consensus was to move forward and ask that you instruct county staff to, to go ahead and create this report. By all means, this is not the final 
of the creation. There's a lot of additional steps that's got to be taken. Janice did give you, and back I think July the 11th, a comparison chart of the, both the fire service and uh, fire protection district and a basic timeline. So tonight, Mr. Chairman, we are asking that you instruct us to move forward with the report as part of the legal process and creation of, of service districts. Any Washington. questions by the board members of this? I just want to ask one question. Um, if I see the current tax rate for the fire districts. Yes, ma'am. Except for the two that don't have any. Um, in your moving forward, um, is there any way for you to show us how each district as it's expanded to include all of the citizens that are served. Um, let me see if I, how can I ask this. If we can see whether that tax rate would go up or down to keep them at the level of money that they're actually receiving now. Not that we would do that, but I would just like to see that. Basically looking at what the budget they have presented and if the growth of the service district increased of what it may do to the tax district is yes in other words how much more money would they receive of uh, the fire department as far as encompassing the additional that basically uh, citizens in that community and that would just indicate to us you know not that we would make the decision to lower it but there may be some cases where we could do that and still increase the total amount of money. So just if you'll make can, sure we get that information. Does that Warren, make we, sense? You know, we could do that based upon, I guess, this year's budget. A couple of factors we don't know about next year would be if you put this into effect, we don't know what their budgets will look like, what they may try to ask for based upon. Right. I just want the information based on previous, you right. know, what has happened when you bring in that many more additional citizens. What you're after, though, and all is to see that if you're served, you pay. Yes, sir. That's and right. That yeah. That's concept. where we're headed, yes. Uh, any other comments by the board? If not, do we have a motion? So move. I second it. All right. I have one comment, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Day. And uh, I would like to ask Noelie a, a mutual aid uh, in these rural uh, fire departments uh, really, really, really also helps to assure that the whole county is covered with fire protection. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Whenever we have structure fires, automatically there is another department that is sent with that first responding department. And in some areas, there's actually two additional departments sent. Right. Plus, then at any given time, whoever's in charge of that scene may request additional uh, equipment to respond. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, do we have a motion to appoint Dr. Ramsey? Oh, we didn't do that. Hasn't voted. Dr. Johnson? Dave? It confirmed. There we go. Thank you. Now, do we have a motion for Dr. Ramsey's term to help forward? So moved. All right, is there a second? Let's vote. Okay, now, uh, on page 27 of your agenda, do we have a motion to terminate Mr. Allen Thomas for reason uh, outlined there? I and to moves. advertise that position? Second. Sure. Ms. Ward, no. Ms. Ward needs a vote. This is on the last page. Oh, okay, I thought I'd already All right, it. now, you got the motion, Madam Clerk, and second? I think that they're asking that the we have a person representing the ETJ Correct. who is a, a Brian Smith Correct. and he's been attending the meetings and he's been um, what do you call it the alternate the ETJ alternate I'm sorry and they're requesting and I think it's a good idea for us to move him into that position so I'd like to include that in the motion and that we Advertise and look for somebody to take the alternate's position. Mm -hmm. All right, ready to vote. 
Okay, now, well, you got an addition, Mr. Manager? Yes, you have the Falkland Volunteer Fire Department request. And again, basically, they're in the process of refinancing an in service fire truck um, through a local bank. And as part of the loan process, they're required to have so doc moved. documents signed by the county. Second. You have this before you. All right, let's move. Okay, Madam Attorney. It has been suggested that this board go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143.318.11A6, 3, and 1, under 1, to prevent the disclosure of confidential information pursuant to the law of this state and the law of the United States, 3, to consult with an attorney employed by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body, and under ground six, to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment, or conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee. Um, with that, if you will move and second, you may go into closed session. Both to approve. All right, do we have a second? Second it. All right. If y'all excuse us, we'll uh, call you back as we need you and hope it will not be long. 